two million people behind bars in America. We open the gates. Lock up. My car was pulled up with beef when I came here. Beat on the door again. Beat on the door again. You, you, I want you to do it. You do it. 98% of these son of a bitches in here ought to be taken out someone shot in the back of the head. Sell it, sell it, sell it, sell it. That's right. Tell me what I'm going to do. Oh, baby, just tell me what I'm going to do. Idle hands is a devil playground, you know, so I stay busy. Think this could get me on American Idol? <laughs> The execution team will escort the condemned from the from the death cell into the execution chamber, place him on the gurney. You ain't here for going to prison. You ain't here because you I'm was doing sure. something constructive. Sure. You have been doing something constructive. You never. I was doing there. something constructive till they oh. me down. Oh. oh. Yeah. In southern Alabama, the Holman Correctional Facility houses some of the state's most dangerous criminals. Over the years, Holman developed a reputation for inmate stabbings, and ambulances were often seen coming to and from the prison. But in recent years, the number of serious incidents has been reduced, partly because of strict policy changes and the supervision of a new warden. The farmland outside Atmore, Alabama, looks much as it did in 1969. That was the year the Holman Correctional Facility, one of Alabama's maximum security prisons, opened its gates. All of Alabama's executions are carried out here. The prison was originally built to house 540 inmates. Today, that population is nearly doubled, and most inmates, including serious felons, live in one of five open dormitories. I've been locked up 12 years, and it's not getting any better around here. They've been trying to pile us in, pile us in more and more. At Holman, 630 beds are dedicated to general population. 200 accommodate inmates in administrative segregation. And 172 are set aside for death row inmates. You have anything from a property offender here all the way to a um, self-proclaimed serial killer. Because a lot of difficult inmates or inmates that other camps can't contain, they will send them to us and we take them and we deal with them. People can get shot up, you know, people can get stabbed up. Wrong place, wrong time, you might get hurt. So it's up to you to maintain and weave, you know what I'm saying? If you can't weave, then you're going to be another statistic. Either you're going to get messed up or locked up. When I was growing up in this area, we used to be literally scared to pass by the road because we would hear all these horror stories of, like, people getting killed. I've seen a guy, you know, get opened up, you know. Um, I've seen stabbings. I've pretty much seen it all. Over the years, Holman's reputation for violence has earned the facility a number of nicknames. The slaughter pen of the South, the house of pain. Some call it dead man name. The bottom, the pit, the beast. Man, this place is savage. It's, it's a messed up prison, you ask me. It's the bottom of the barrel. People call it the bottom. The bottom. Everybody calls it the bottom. It was terrible at one time. You know, you might have uh, two or three fights going on at the same time stabbings, um, quite a few killings. It's not like working at a Walmart. Since becoming the warden at Holman, Grant Culliver has tried to steer the prison away from its violent past. He has set up procedures enabling inmates to settle disputes with words, not weapons. Back in the day, they fought it out, and then later on, someone more likely to get killed. But to, today, they've come to a staff member and discussed with a staff member, and they were in it right there. I expect an officer to be, be a professional, treat uh, the MA population firm, but fair. Anthony Fuller, I got your first shakedown. Officers also keep things under control by conducting surprise shakedowns, random searches for hidden contraband. I found a knife. Did you grab the finish? On this jacket on the floor, on the head of the bed, part of the cigarettes. That's, that may be the catalyst that leads to something, but if, uh, if somebody owes me a, a, a soda pop, and they come to me and say, hey, man, uh, I need to get that soda pop you on me. And I spit in their face and talk to them like they a bitch or something, you know. And then they kill me. Whose fault is it? You wasn't about to soda pop no more. You know, on the street, yeah, you call the police and put a stop to that. What are you doing here? I tell you what you do. You go get you a knife and you stab that son of a bitch and you say you ain't taking nothing else. You know, that's the end of that. Here's what happens when you come to take something from me. 
98% of these son of a bitches in here ought to be taken out somewhere and shot in the back of the head. Maybe, maybe I'm, not, I'm part of that 98%. At Holman, inmates like Bobby Gilbert, who commit a violent act, are sent to administrative segregation, or SEG. Here, they spend 23 hours a day in solitary confinement. In SEG, they can't smoke. They can't be out without being handcuffed. They have to have someone escort them everywhere they go. Treat me like I'm an animal. I ain't no animal. I'm a human being like everybody in this world. I think the idea of it is a deterrent, you know, to, to keep to make them want to do right. So maybe they spend a little time back here in this single cell lockup. They might want, when they get out, want to do better and do the right thing. Depending on the offense, time spent in SEG can be anywhere from 90 days to an indefinite period of time. I came lockup, come back straight about six years ago. They told me when they can let me out. It's been almost six years in a, in a one-man cell. SEG time is worse during an Alabama summer when temperatures inside the cells can become extremely hot. Tremendously hot. And it gets wet, don't cool off none. It's just way at night time, too. Best you can do is get two or three hours of sleep early in the morning time. And then after that, just get up and pace the floor and try to get cooled off the best way you can. One of the inmates here is Stephen Parker, a self-proclaimed shot caller in the Aryan Brotherhood gang. Parker recently landed in SEG for slashing a fellow inmate's throat with a box cutter. I was going to get some... Uh swastikas tattooed on the side of my neck because I just thought it would look cool. I wanted to get two of them on each side like Frankenstein bolts and me and him had worked a deal and I kept going back to him and we kept on going around for about two months. He said he's going to pay somebody else to run them. I said, well, you just need to give me my money back and he didn't want to do it. So, uh, so I went for the <laughs> Parker has been in trouble before. At another prison, he nearly strangled an inmate to death. He's serving a life sentence for murdering his stepmother and almost killing his father. And I went and rang their doorbell. When they opened it, I shot him at point blank range. A lot of people, you know, they villainized me for that. But, you know, I, like I said, I grew up with parents that didn't give a about me. And I'm not trying to excuse my behavior. I wasn't racist until I started landing in jails and in prisons, kept getting jumped on over and over again. Then I became racist. And I don't, I wear it proudly. I got, I got the swastikas and I got the uh, Sustafa bolts. <laughs> Stephen Parker is crazy. He's, he's not, I mean, um, no more, no less. He, he's not a person that's very intelligent. We stand for uh, racial supremacy. We want to control the penitentiary system. It wouldn't take much to uh, decide a ride or whatever, you know. You can take four officers hostage at the same time, and uh, it's going to domino. It's going to domino. It's all, they don't have control. It's just a delusion. Forbidden to write letters in SEG to general population, Parker says he's able to communicate with fellow Aryan Brotherhood inmates by writing to friends on the outside. They're lazy. They don't read the mail. The, the, uh, the mail clerk doesn't. I don't think she would have time to read the mail, even if she wanted to. This letter is from Stephen Parker to an inmate named Reese. Kyra Guyton is in charge of reading the mail at Holman. She has just intercepted one of Parker's unauthorized letters containing insulting language about Warden Culliver. He wrote, uh, Culliver... <laughs> And I'm not going to read all of that because there's a lot of cussing in it. Uh, he's an idiot, freaks everyone like, uh, and treats everyone like inferiors or children. I cannot stand that. And he is a uh, supercilious jackass. <laughs> Stephen Parker's a weirdo anyway. Very weird. That's why he stays locked up in the back. Coming up. I don't think that there's any good way uh, to have to take a life. The sidebar to that, of course, is the individual that's being put to death took a life inside Alabama's only execution chamber. This is the execution chamber at the Holman Correctional Facility. In Alabama, death row inmates are executed on this gurney. The sentences are always carried out at 6 in the evening. I was 16 when the crime happened. I was 18 years old when I was sentenced to death. I was charged with capital murder consisting of four more deaths in one act of ski. I was sentenced to death by the jury and judge. The jury voted 10 votes to two for death. I was living with my father. Me and him couldn't get along. Looking back, it's a lot of the trouble that me and him had with my fault. Things kept escalating. We got into fights. It just got to the point where, in my mind at that time, I didn't feel like I had any way out. 
next time we got into a fight, as soon as I got him off of him, I started shooting. I didn't stop shooting until the gun was empty. And during the fight with me and my father, my stepmother and two stepsisters were in the house. When the fight started, they ran upstairs. A friend went after He kicked in a bathroom door. He shot the woman. He cut the little girl's throat. And he found another little girl and cut her throat. And when he come back downstairs, he told me what had happened. We decided to make up a cover story. We made it try to look like a robber. The police knew right away that there wasn't nothing going on with that. So they arrested us and charged both of us for capital murder. The execution team will escort the condemned from, the, from his death cell into the execution chamber, place him on the gurney. A uh, microphone is basically used uh, to read the death warrant to the condemned and also to allow the condemned to make a last statement. Prior to being arrested and going to arraignment, I didn't even know Alabama had a death penalty. So when the judge told me the sentences that I faced, I didn't think he was telling the truth. I didn't think that from that point on, yeah, I knew I was coming to death row. I knew I was going to death row. The warden stands uh, at this point. He look back into the execution chamber. Um, there's a um, intercom system that allows the warden to communicate with the uh, commissioner uh, for any last minute stays. And once he's given the okay to proceed, then uh, in the state of Alabama, the warden has performed the execution by lethal injection. The drug concoction is uh, made up of uh, three different drugs. Seven syringes are used. Sodium pentothal renders the prisoner unconscious. Pavilon paralyzes the muscles. Potassium chloride stops the heart. There are times when I wanted them to execute. I mean, because the weight of dealing with the issue, it gets unbearable. I mean, you want to just say, hey, man, look, I quit. I'm going to drop my appeals, y'all kill it. I don't think that there is any good way uh, to have to take a life. The sidebar to that, of course, is the individual that's being put to death took a life. I look at it as, as just the, the general public of the state of Alabama actually carrying out the execution. I just happen to be the tool uh, in place to be able to do that. If I refuse to do that, then I, I'm actually refusing to carry out a law that I said that I would uphold. I started. I'm responsible for all four deaths because they might have never started the killing none of it would have ever happened. In some way, I wish that there was something I could do to help the victims' families find closure or make peace with what happened. I can't do anything but apologize. In 2005, the U.S. Supreme Court ruled it unconstitutional to impose the death penalty on juveniles who commit murder before their 18th birthday. Since he was convicted of a killing at the age of 16, his sentence was changed to life without parole. I was outside, an officer called me to the red door that goes back into death row, told me to pack my stuff that I was being moved to the segregation unit. I packed my stuff and left. Mark Duke! You hear a lot of stuff about prison. And I was scared of leaving the environment that I had become known in. People knew me and I knew people to a new environment that everybody says is worse. So in that respect, I was scared. I was happy not to have a distance. But I was scared to go to the Sega. It's still a distance. I still feel like I'm a walking dead man. I'm not going to be executed, but I'm going to die in prison. The difference in the sentence isn't that great. Now I wait. 20, 30 years before I die, instead of maybe three or four. Up next, prisoners find love behind bars. I love him, and uh, if I could marry him in the state of Alabama, I would. Due to mature subject matter, viewer discretion is advised. At the Holman Correctional Center in Alabama, prison officials impose strict policies on sexual activity. Conjugal visits are not allowed, and anything considered pornographic is screened by male clerk Kyra Guyton. The breast can actually show, but the nipples can't. One thing that they cannot have is Playboy, Hustler, anything like that that is way revealing. Even pictures from home, they can't have like that. And 
I've had several of them. But when it comes to relationships between inmates, Warden Culliver takes a different approach. If an officer finds an inmate participating in a homosexual act, a disciplinary action is taken. Uh, that individual will go to um, segregation for a period of time. But if we know that two people are in a relationship, generally we don't do anything with that. If they are not openly having sex, and I'm saying you can have a relationship that doesn't have sex involved. As far as the sex part is concerned, it is very, very frustrating and uncomfortable, especially if that's something that you really want to do because you, you have to try to beat the police and inmates. And what I mean by that is it's done quick and quietly. Keith Mason, who goes by the name Precious, is a divorced former pastor serving a life term for robbery and aggravated assault. Marquise Nobles is serving 15 years for robbery and kidnapping. For the past six years, the two men have enjoyed a relationship behind bars. He had a shy innocence when I first met him, so I think that was another part that really attracted me to him, but by the same aspect, I, I really fell in love with him. Every morning, Precious gets coffee for Marquise. He sews for him and keeps their area clean. In prison terms, Marquise and Precious are man and wife. <laughs> you know, man. I got on my band and his. That's mine, that's his. I love him. And uh, if I could marry him in the state of Alabama, I would. I got his name on me right there. Come on, baby. While Precious and Marquise freely admit to having a sexual relationship in prison, Marquise says he prefers women. I'm in prison. There's no women in here, but there are men that want to be women, so, you know, I have to deal with it while I'm in here. I'm straight. I mean, I like, I like feminine men, so, you know, however you want to look at it, as you call it, you know, homosexual, you being gay, you know, everybody had a different word, but as far as in here, you know, he's a woman and I'm a man. So. Marquise and Precious insist their relationship isn't just about sex. Both speak of a bond rarely shared in prison. Yeah, I love him probably harder than I've ever loved any woman. You know what I'm saying? And I have 13 children. I have nine daughters and four sons. This is my partner. This is my friend. This is, this is, you know, the person that gave me strength. You know, like I said, I don't have family or anything. This is the person that helps me out day to day. So I can't just deny him when I get out, but now you have to understand that this is just for, this, this lifestyle as far as the, the sexual thing, this is just for now because I'm locked up. I do this because I want to, not because I have to. Actually, I do this because I like it. While some inmates stay out of trouble in committed relationships, others act out their sex. Inmates outrage over conditions at Holman. Due to mature subject matter, viewer discretion is advised. There are two million people behind bars in America. We open the gates. Lock up. As is the case at many maximum security prisons, some inmates locked up for rule infractions at Alabama's Holman Correctional Facility complain of unfair treatment. Warden Grant Culliver maintains that regulations at Holman are not only fair, they reflect what the public expects of the prison system. Once a year, every prisoner at Holman comes up for a progress review before Warden Culliver and Supervisor James Powers. This is your annual progress review. We'll come up with his termination, uh, his needs, whether his needs can be met here or he needs to be moved to a facility where programs to meet his uh, specific needs. For inmates confined to segregated lockdown, the process review board comes to them. We will want to do Bob Gibble first. And they want to do Bob Gibble first okay. and uh, get him out the way. 801 to 84. We're 1084, your unit. Bobby Gilbert has asked for a transfer to another maximum security facility closer to his family's home. He waits while a table is set up in the hallway. What are you chewing on? Dog. Where you get some dog from? Oh, nigger red dog. Hey, you know that disease. You on a nigger red? How long you been on that? A year and a half. Yeah, so so you want to see his own thing stops his cramps and the diarrhea and blood down. Is that right? Yeah. Is that how it works? Same thing happens. How much they give you? Ten pieces a day. Ten pieces a day? How much you say? I, I had to discover that population. How much you say? I don't say I'm a I'm selling more, man. You got me hooked on it, too. <laughs> you selling some of it. See, see that boy wrong there? Y'all don't make this some more. See. I think you're going to get paid. Depends on what you can. Whatever it was. I'm going to make football season here. Oh, okay. come on, have a seat over here. Right. Knowing the cameras are rolling, inmates disrupt the proceedings by banging on their cell door. Who be you, shoot for Yeah. 
Beat on the door again. You, you, I want you to do it. You do it. You beat on the motherfucking door again. I don't be no cow. Beat on the door again. Put his ass out door. As soon as we get the out here. After the inmates quiet down, Gilbert's review gets underway. Gilbert has made little, if any, progress while in SEG, and prison officials have confiscated his most treasured possession, a chess set. But right now, your behavior wants no transfer, okay? Anything you'd like to talk about? You about summed it up. I sure would like to have my chess pieces back. Why can't I have my chess pieces, boy, folks? Segregation. What you gonna do with chess pieces? Get you, get you some paper. Draw you out a check. I'm playing my hand. This is the man. That's all it is. Do I just don't see where it can hurt anybody unless somebody has something semi-constructive to do in that cell. Ask the uh, law library clerk next time to come through and bring you a copy of Admin Reg and see if it says you're supposed to have chess pieces. Well, you, you, you're the man. You run this place. And I follow the regs. That's what I'm saying. That, that's your decision. And I follow the regs. The regs say we're supposed to be able to have books, you know. That's what I'm telling you, get the red and read it, because it don't say that. If it said that, you'd have it. It's segregation. It wasn't meant to be nice. I'm you, ain't, you ain't here for going to church. You ain't here because, because you was doing some construction. Sure. If you had been doing some construction, you never would have been I was doing some construction until they f***ed me down. Oh, f yeah. It's always somebody else's fault. You want us to be exhibit some form of model behavior. But then every avenue is close to us to do anything constructive. We can't read a novel because we can't handle it. I can't play chess through the mail like I used to because my chess piece we took away from me. I was jumping up on the door, sticking through the train or every time a female came up there. I guess that's model behavior. Uh, you have to come in stern. Uh, you need to come in firm. Uh, you need to be fair. And you need to be able to say no. Denied possession of his chess set, Gilbert is outraged, claiming his punishment would never happen at other prisons. Donaldson don't do this crap. St. Clair don't do this. Anywhere else, I can sit, oh, I've ordered 10, 15 books a week at Donaldson. I have art supplies at St. Clair and West Jefferson. Only here they strip you of everything but a naked sale. That's rehabilitation at its finest. Gilbert isn't the only inmate in SEG expressing frustration. Well, the union force against me. I've been in SEG now since I've been here from Kirby from 2004. But they didn't beat me and jumped me, sprayed me, my, and my mouth was made with full cans of mate, made me on myself, excuse my French. Inmate Jamie Bell, convicted of receiving stolen property, claims the conditions in SEG are intolerable. I can't breathe in here. I can't get nothing out of here. My toilet was full up with feces when I came here. They did not flush it. Nothing. It was stinking. Bugs and everything running right around here. They throw me in the cell. I had to wait all day yesterday. Inside the crowded dorms of the Holman Correctional Facility in Alabama, inmates' personal space is limited. This is me right here. And uh, that's about it. Man. We try to respect everybody's little space you got, but you know, this is it. These are my trial transcripts. There's my Scrabble dictionary. Family pictures. Got two of these full of pictures. This was uh, my mom gave me this. This was her first Bible don't necessarily believe in God, but uh, if anybody ever did something to this or that, then I'd have another murder charge. In these tight quarters, many inmates occupy themselves with hobbies. Donald Hargrove is sketching blueprints for a strip club. That's a dance stage. These are pool tables. This is the main club. That's the main ball. This is a dance stage. Dancers dressing room. And all that's the VIP lounge. I've really designed houses. I got a whole bunch of them up under my bed. Paddle hands is a devil's playground, you know, so I stay busy. Robert Tedder, incarcerated since the mid-1980s on several sex and obscenity charges, was a general contractor. In prison, he uses his construction and electrical skills to build homemade guitars. Okay, the guitar is made out of boat kits. This is two and a half boat kits makes this one. Model boat kits are an approved hobby item for inmates in general population. Tedder combined his with scrap transistor radio parts. All of these are stood up together, glued together to make this neck like this. The inside of the guitar is all wood. We have one radio, the uh, tone control, got three controls down here, the set of batteries, 
Then we break it down further, we pull this apart. This comes completely out. This is the pickup. Dowel sticks is used for the uh, for the tuning keys. It has a mic built into the top of it here, and then a mic plug in the top of it, and then additional plugs in the tail end. With headphones, Tedder can play in the crowded dorm and not disturb his neighbor. After success with the first, Tedder crafted another guitar for his friend Jerome Berard, who is serving life without parole for a drug-related double murder. I paid the, pr the prison equivalent of $25 for it, which was nine packs of cigarettes. And he's had more highs off a guitar than he'd ever had off of drugs. He, just, he don't even fool with that anymore. Yeah, learning to play guitar has been one of the, the high points of my life. It's a shame I had to do it here, but uh, it's a miracle I did it. You think this could get me on American Idol? <laughs> While Tedder and Berard pass the time playing guitar, a contraband brew called Prison Julep provides an escape for other inmates. Of course, yeast is a catalyst for that. Um, they're not able to steal the yeast per se, but now they will take uh, raw dough and try to hide raw dough and keep it. They'll take bread to use. Uh, any, any type of a juice that has any form of sugar in it, uh, they will use that. Today, officers perform a random search in one of Holman's general population dorms. Though looking for any type of contraband, they keep a nose out for prison julep. You can smell the aroma coming out of this box. It's uh, got prunes in it. They just wait till it ferments good. It's got a strong whiskey aroma. And they're keeping these airtight jugs so it ferments good. It gets good and hot. Then they sell it for bags of chips or cigarettes, smokes, or cold drinks or whatever they can get for it. That's how they make their little living in here, just to survive. There are ways to make legitimate money at Holman. Here at the tag plant, inmates make license plates and are paid 30 cents an hour. Prisoners can spend their hard-earned cash on food items in Holman's sandwich store. I buy candy, coats, zuzus, wham whams, Honey buns. I crave honey buns. I buy honey buns. We have our jumbo honey buns. We got the blueberry and we got the butterhorn. <laughs> I can't buy no wine. Can't buy no kind of alcohol. There's nothing like that. Armand Power received a life sentence for auto theft after threatening to kill his trial judge. Tell him to kiss my ass. I ain't gonna take that life without him. I'm gonna kill him. And I jump for him. And they jumped me. The police got me walking me upstairs laughing at me. I ain't never seen nobody as short as I am jump a judge. Develop an anger management program. And I kept brushing them off because I feel like, you know what I'm saying, I don't have time to be on sucking up to those people, you know what I'm saying, coming by my cell, uh, talking to me, but he wouldn't give up. You know what I'm kept coming by my cell and pulling me out of my cell and talking to him. We have a history. We're trying to help him. And he is responding to it, he responded well, and then we have high hopes for him. As far as being fair, more than you are one. I appreciate that. That I, means a lot. I do give you that part. I told you we weren't going to give up. You said that. And we're not. Through good behavior, some inmates at Holman earn the right to live in a faith-based honor dorm. It simply means that you believe in a higher power, whether that be God, Buddha, um, you know, whatever that is, it's the higher power. The faith-based dorm has been a real winner for us here. Willie Williams is one of the 170 inmates living in the faith-based dorm. He admits to killing a woman 17 years ago while high on drugs. We both were smoking cocaine. It ran out. I asked her if I could pawn her VCR. She smoked most of the dope, and she said no. I got mad, you know, and I took her life. I stabbed her with a, a kitchen knife. And after I killed her, then I, I took the VCR and went and pawned it for some more dope. I come to a place and realize that she didn't deserve what I did to her. 
you know, I was a bad person and I wanted change. I wanted to be different. That's when I got saved. I embraced Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. And I believe he's really real. My hope is that people will see that that people can be redeemed. Would anyone else like to share concerning the letter at this time? As an exercise in empathy and self-awareness, inmates seeking rehabilitation are encouraged to write, but not mail, letters of apology to their victims. At the age of 23, Dale Faulkner raped a woman and went to prison. At 42, he was paroled and started a new life. Yeah. I was very fortunate there were people willing to help me. And so I was able to get out, start a life, uh, start with a good job, and I worked my way up. I got married, had a beautiful daughter, but I got too prideful. I started thinking, okay, I got this. I can start back drinking a beer or two every now and then. Then I started getting deeper back into the old person than I was before. I started cheating on my wife. On parole, Faulkner had an affair with a woman and her 16-year-old daughter. Repair the damage I've done. Legally and everything, and moralistically, yes, it was dead wrong. There's no excuse for it. I had no business with a 16-year-old girl. Somehow, word got out, I got arrested, and I got charged with second-degree rape. They gave me 20 years, run concurrent with the original life sentence. Now, Dale Faulkner is trying again to rehabilitate himself, starting with a letter to his rape victim of 26 years ago. I would give anything to be able to turn back time and remove the harm that I caused in your life. The things that happened the night that I met you were completely my fault. If there is anything that you have felt bad about on your part, please let it go. It was totally on me. I think a lot of the guys here have been able to see a way of changing their lifestyles. They have hope one day that they'll get back outside. 40% of the criminals who enter state prison in America are former inmates who have violated their parole. While this statistic may raise doubts as to the effectiveness of rehabilitation behind bars, officials at Holman maintain that rehab programs not only improve inmate behavior, they help reduce violence inside the institution. That's our report. Thanks for watching. I'm John Siegenthaler.